thanks everybody for joining our session here today. As Jen mentioned, I'm John Paquette. I'm VP Solutions for TIS's US market. And today we have a very forward-looking conversation, really exploring some of the key trends for Treasury to keep in focus as we move into 2023. So the basis for today's conversation was actually a survey that we launched in partnership with Treasury webinars, where we asked the community a number of different questions on various topics that are you know, important to the Treasury community. Everything from Treasury's role within the organization to staffing expectations through planned tech investments, really covering a broad range of topics. The survey really covered you know, multiple different industries. We had good participation across sort of all verticals, right? And even from company size, covering everything from you know, the SME all the way up to Fortune 150 companies responding to the survey. So it's a good sort of mesh of opinion here, right? And so what we tried to do is, is basically take all those results, synthesize those down into six key trends for Treasury to keep in focus. And the purpose of this call here today, this, this coffee talk that we're hosting, is to take those six key trends, assemble a panel of industry thought leaders, and sort of bring some additional context into what are the drivers of some of those trends, right? So what we're going to look to do here today. I definitely look forward to the conversation. I think it should be you know, very lively, and I apologize in advance if we don't get to all six points. We'll certainly strive to do that, uh, at least touch on everything sort of briefly here during the progression of the conversation. So, but before we jump in, definitely want to give an opportunity for the panel to introduce themselves. So, you know, maybe we could go through here. I'll just sort of, you know, introduce you guys one by one as you appear on my screen left to right. Uh, Kate, maybe you could go first here with an introduction. Okay. I was afraid you do that, John. Anyway, thank you very much. And I really appreciate being able to join today. Um, I was, my background is actually commercial banking for over 30 years, transaction services, relationship, risk. Um, and for the last four years, I've been freelance, working as an advisor, consultant, moderator, and coach, specializing in financial services. Hi, I'm Dan Blumen. Uh, I've been around for a very, very long time um, uh, as a commercial banker and uh, a global commercial banker in the U.S. and Asia and, uh, and Europe, and as a founding partner at Treasury Alliance Group. And uh, there we advise people on payments and treasury structures, uh, liquidity arrangements, and pretty much whatever comes through and uh, very happy to be here uh, a very interesting survey and should be a, a provocative conversation craig jeffrey the managing partner of strategic treasure we're an advisory firm uh, covering global domestic organizations uh, even uh, government uh, institutions we also um, have a media arm so you'll probably see us on ctm file or content that uh, goes out through that uh, channel both uh, media curation and then finally, on the, the research side, we, uh, we do quite a bit of market research on a global basis across all sectors of Treasury. And John, it's good to uh, be here with you and everybody else again. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ernie Humphrey. I'm the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Elf uh, at Treasury Webinars. So I'm honored to be here uh, on the panel. Craig's already shaking his head. It's just getting started, Craig. Don't worry. There's much more to come. Uh, <laughs> on, honored to work on the survey, honored to have TIS as a strategic partner. Um, I've been in the thought leadership game for probably 10 or 15 years. I was a longtime corporate treasury manager and I worked at AFP uh, back in the day. So my whole gist is trying to empower people to take ownership um, of their careers and going to have fun now that John is the moderator and I'm not. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Great to have you with us. Um, I'm Jörg, co-founder of TIS. In that role, since 12 years with the company, I spent eight years before I started this company. I spent eight years as a senior vice president and head of global treasury working for SAP. Long story short, the problems which we solve today for our clients, these were my problems in my former life. All right. Thank you, Jörg. And thanks to the whole group for being here. Really looking forward to the conversation here today. So with that, maybe we jump right into the first theme here. Right? So the theme one of our survey results was Treasury strategic, strategic influence is growing within the organization. And I think this is something you hear a lot, right? Strate Treasury is becoming less operational, more strategic. We definitely saw those results permeate throughout the survey, right? So we had 40%, 47% of respondents indicate that Treasury is either a key or occasional advisor on strategic matters with the CFO. Nearly 60% said they expect Treasury's strategic role to actually increase during 2023. And 81% of respondents said they plan to spend more time on strategic activities during the course of 2023, right? So maybe we start here with a question, and Dan, I might phrase this one to you here just to kind of open up the conversation. Do you think treasurers are correct in their perception that Treasury is becoming more strategic? And I guess if so, 
what are these strategic responsibilities everybody's referring to? And are there implications sort of for the practitioners out there that you know need to be considered to be a valuable you know strategic member of your organization? Sure, I, I think Craig got it right with naming his company strategic treasurer. But I, I sort of want to get a, a little difference in here, and maybe it's a, a small one, but it's what I see. There's a difference between being critical and being strategic. And Treasury's never been more critical. I mean, you go through a pandemic and you look at liquidity issues, um, Treasury's critical. Uh, you look at payment issues coming now, especially with uh, some of the adventures we've seen in the crypto market as they relate to payments and other things. So, you know, uh, you're, you're critical. Now, strategic is, are you forward looking and seeing around the corner? And that's something that treasurers earn. That's not given to them. Um, and the kind of thing there is, do you have a playbook for the next crisis? You know, do you have some thoughts when the treasurer comes and says, we've decided, or, you know, the CFO says, we've decided to get into streaming. How do you plan to collect, a, you know, a couple of million uh, low value payments over the year? And that's strategic when you don't have to go hubbada, 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 give me a week and I'll get back to you. Uh, you know, the kind of other things are you've done some modeling around liquidity. So when there's a major acquisition, you have sources of liquidity for that. You're prepared to address issues such as the need for multiple payment channels. Those things are earned. So, you know, in some other research we did, we saw that, um, you know, the, when you, you know you're strategic when the CFO schedules some time with you on a regular basis to come in and say, you know, what's going on? You know, where do you see the commodity markets going? How are those, you know, do we have anything that's going to come and bite us in the next six months, 18 months, 36 months? But absolutely, Treasury has never been more critical. Um, this, is, this is a sweet place to be these days. Yeah, agreed. More critical. It seems less siloed too. You know what I mean? Like Treasury previously sort of stayed in their lane, did their operational processes, did their wires, cash management, and now it seems like we definitely saw throughout the survey results that Treasury feels they're a supplier of key data within the organization. Right? They're collecting a lot of key information and sort of being the one that facilitates yeah. the transition of that data throughout the through the throughout the company. But is that the same as being strategic? Oh, yeah. sure. Well, I think one of the one of the points I like to add, and then I'd really love to hear what the other panelists have to say, is that you know you're starting to see Treasury be get involved in being involved uh, a product team. So if they're going to launch a new product, you know, is Treasury on that team, and is Treasury saying here are some ideas we have to make it more appealing? Okay, I'm done. Over to other people. Uh, yeah, York, I know I'd love to get your thoughts on this one. Former practitioner and obviously very close to the market in, uh, in your current role. So, you know, any thoughts on strate uh, Treasury's strategic role within organizations? Yeah, from my perspective, absolutely. Treasury is becoming more strategic. And why is this? Uh, because the treasurer starts to better leverage the data. Treasurers, they are sitting on a gold mine of data, and this is great, right? This uh, is cash flow data. Cash flow uh, tells you the truth. Accounting is an opinion from yesterday, but it is crucial for the treasurer to leverage this gold mine of data. Uh, the data needs to be transferred into actionable data and into strategic advantage. And a good example is uh, cash forecasting working capital management. If you are successful, to free up valuable financial resources to improve cash conversion cycles uh, and uh, at the end to allow the company to uh, grow faster because they have more capital to invest. This um, is a strategic uh, aspect. Another good example is to turn tre uh, treasury into a profit center while using virtual cards or uh, improve yield optimization. Um, these are strategic points, and this is what we see in the market as a key trend right now. John, I would, I would just like to add something. I mean, for, for me, it's just a very simple comment. The more complicated the world becomes, the more volatile, the more important cash visibility, going back to what Jörg said, is, is absolutely key, which I would think raises the profile immediately of, of Treasury. Um, in order to really understand where your cash is and really be able to do something with it. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I think the other trend we're seeing is that Treasury is becoming more of a business partner internally, you know what I mean? So they're they're interacting more with the AR departments, with the AP departments, and really bringing the business insights into what those what what those departments are doing or impacting the business. So AR, hey, we start DSO creep from 45 days to 55 days. 
And on the treasury side, we saw 10 days of cash evaporate, you know, so this matters. This is sort of, you know, keeping pace on these business activities, measuring metrics, KPIs, things like that. And treasury's doing, I think those that are starting to move towards being strategic are doing a good job sort of playing that central role in the cash conversion cycle. So maybe we should move into, nope. Yeah, John, I'll, I'll just jump in. I think I think you're bringing up a good point, and your your focus on the working capital management cash conversion cycle is is strategic from that financial bent. And then just echoing what Dan said, this idea of product development helping the business those are those are areas that move the business in a significant way. And I can't help but smile at what Jorg said about accounting as an opinion and cash flow as the reality. And there's just a couple items on that, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, there's turbulence and there's uh, this critical aspect of managing these tough times. It's like, you know, when you're flying, you're like, someone's driving a bus, but you really want a skilled pilot when there's a storm. And there's a there's an element of being strategic is whether there's a storm or not, there's certain activities that need to be done. It gets recognized a little bit more when there is that uh, turbulence of you know, commodity price, supply chain disruption. Um, you know, uh, you know, interest rate shifts, all those things lend more insight to it. So, uh, plus it's, it's good if you have a nice green Christmas cap, that is, uh, that is also to be desired. Yeah. yeah. So from that perspective, maybe the response are correct and that there's more opportunities to be strategic looking into 2023 with some of the volatility we're expecting the economic downturn, right? So that's, uh, that's definitely mm -hmm. an interesting trend. But maybe a good transition into theme two that we saw during the course of our survey. So theme two is that you know staffing priorities within Treasury remain elevated. So you now we had close to a sort of 50-50 split for responses in terms of you know expectations around staffing. About 50% said they thought levels were going to remain the same. About 50% said they thought staffing levels were actually going to increase. And only about 3% said they expected staffing levels to decrease. And it's not just Staffing, there, you know, also professional development opportunities are expected to increase year over year, starting next year, with 55% expecting some sort of increase in professional development or uh, opportunities within their organization. And so, you know, Ernie, maybe I go with, to you with this question here, but you know, certainly we know the economic climate we're dealing with here, right? We know the the downturn, the threat of a looming recession. You hear the news about. You know, so do you think Treasury is being a little bit over optimistic in their expectations for you know 2023 20, staffing levels? Or, you know, I guess what do you think is really driving Treasury to sort of maintain the same levels even in an economic downturn? Uh, I think I think I hope that's not my phone. Um part of it is is really uh due to the people mentioned the complexity, but I think driving this is is that we are now being focused on understanding the why. So in Treasury, we've been facing what happened, what happened, what happened, and now we're focused on why it happened. And we realize that we need technology to do that. The technology now exists for us to understand the why. And so we know that we might need people with a different skill set, maybe on the technology side. And what we've seen since the pandemic is more technology adoption, right? And so it's like anything else. When there's a problem, what happens? We react. So where's cash? What's cash? What's it doing? So I think there's this onus that we have the opportunity because the spotlight's on us, right? And I think that we're ready to do that. And one of the things that was encouraging from the survey, obviously the survey is not the whole market, careful with those inferences, but for these companies, they see uh, the value. And so people always thought automation and everything was going to decrease. Well, I've seen this across the office of the CFO, AP, AR surveys, SP&A to come. People are staffing up, and Treasury will always be thinly staffed, but we are still we are seeing um, some positive uh, momentum uh, on that front, and I think it makes sense as we start to dive in to the survey. Expectations are on the rise, complexity is on the rise. The first time, even before I got my green Santa hat, we are going to have the tools um, to be successful, and companies realize the value that we can offer. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it even seems like you're starting to see new roles emerge in Treasury that weren't there before, like Treasury systems people or more technology focused specific Treasury roles. So it definitely seems to be a, a growing area within businesses, you know, particularly as, as sort of tech investments sort of become more and more highlighted within Treasury too. So I don't know if the other group, the rest of the group has any thoughts on the staffing question here, but certainly, you know, willing to sort of hear everybody's opinions on this one. 
we have, um, if we look back over at least the last five to seven years, I haven't looked at some of the, the data from surveys that show companies, companies are adding treasury on a net basis. There's some that decline in numbers, some that increase. Uh, it's usually around 14 to 20% of companies per year add in treasury. Not a lot, they're still thinly staffed. Uh, don't get too excited. But uh, that's very different from lots of other areas of finance that are shrinking. They're going from 50 people in an area to 20 down. And so this is a this is a long secular trend of the value, the, the strategic value, the importance. Um, crises help treasury, uh, but that's a that's an ongoing trend. This is not an isolated shift. Just now it's a continued trend, which is I think good for the industry. Let me pose a let me pose a question to Craig and to Ernie here. I mean, is some of that due to the fact that payments have become much more important and sometimes are folded into treasury? Is some of that growth coming from that? Uh, I think it's, I mean, ahead, Craig. I think, uh, uh, let, let me hop in first because Craig knows I can't resist talking. Um, so, so really, um, I think that could be part of it. But again, I think I, I go back to my comment. It's the why. And you're right. So now we realize, I'll talk about this a little later. I'm, I'm previewing cash management used to mean what do you do with the cash you have? Not controlling the movement, optimizing the payment type and timing and optimizing when it's coming in and how it's coming in. So I definitely, I definitely think that that has a part to do with, do of it and really understanding what control of means. Cash management, I, I wanna say cash control and that's where we need to get to and we're realizing we need to do that and treasury needs to lead the way. So yes, I, I agree. As on a long roundabout answer, I, I agree on that side. <laughs> Yeah, so some of the some of the I'll call it the the general task, uh, you know, gathering up information to get visibility to your accounts was more manual, it's becoming less manual. So there's there is a shift away from those towards things like you're mentioning, Dan, like um, you know, focused on new payment rails or helping with new payment setups, new formats, but but putting in new technology, doing additional analysis, uh, more focused on risk management. Um, those are those are definitely growing. It's harder to see that from all the uh, individual survey data, but those are, um, that's that's definitely good intuition or from what you've seen and experienced that those areas are growing. Yeah, and then maybe moving from, you know, purely staffing questions to thinking more about the skills that treasury departments are looking for within their departments, you know, I think theme number three that we saw within the survey was that cash management and data management are really coveted skills within treasury organizations. So. You know, you have essentially, based on the responses here, 40% in each category, indicating that it was the most important skill to get in 23, 40% indicating cash management, 40% indicating data management, data analytics skills were right behind that, right? Um, and even more so for, you know, sort of bifurcating the, the results by uh, a small market, mid-market, enterprise level, for mid-market and enterprise level organizations, Cash management skills across the board, most important skills to upgrade in 2023. So maybe we could discuss this trend a little bit because you know, cash management's been around forever. <laughs> Before Treasury was the Treasury Department, it was the cash management department. So it's not as if cash management's a new thing, but you know, what continues to evolve here that is making this such a strong focal point for organizations and feeling they need to continuously sort of upgrade the skill year after year. And you know, Ernie, maybe I'll give you the first word on this one as well. Okay, thank you. Um, with the first word, I have to change my my hat. So, <laughs> all right. Now, the people. Um, someone once asked me if I'm an entertainer or a thought leader, and I said I'm both. I use my entertainment to get your attention. So, for me, I was thinking about this today. I already previewed. I had an epiphany, but when I was thinking about it. Like I said, I think I was first said, "What do you mean we need cash management skills?" But then when I thought about it, again, I was thinking, "Well." we're understanding and we want control of cash and now we have visibility we want to understand the why so that makes sense that people realize that i think what people look at as successful cash management is probably different right could we see it before it was so hard to just get reporting we didn't even know what happened let alone why it happened and it wasn't quite as important as craig mentioned we have all these crises going on supply chain covid geopolitical instability and and now i think Oh, I think that makes more sense. And then we also see the data analysis and IT, and I'm like, 
well, how do I reconcile that with what I think are more important or soft skills? But when you think about it, in order to win approval for the technology, in order to get that implemented across the enterprise, that takes uh, soft skills as well. So I, now I, I've explained that to myself, cash management, it's a different animal. People realize that might be a little bit of a different skill set. The why is a little bit different than arguing with banks about MT940. Sorry, I'm old. Um, but I think that's I think that's part of it. But I am glad to see that we are seeing a focus on the soft skills, and that's what I see. I'm talking to recruiters like Mike Richards. I I, I hear a lot people, and especially in the management, people want the soft skills, collaboration skills. Um, but that has to be with the others. But treasurers, they're looking for more of those soft skills. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, it seems like the expectation in general is is changing for Treasury. It's not just, hey, calculate the cash position and send out that report. Calculate out the cash position and figure out how we're going to most effectively use our cash, you know, and, and you have a lot of factors as you move into 2023. Borrowing costs are no longer at historic lows. They're rising. People are thinking about more about how they're using cash. Treasuries have more tools at their disposal than ever, you know, between, you know, yield optimization products, supply chain financing products, you know, uh, dynamic discounting products, a lot of different ways you can use your cash, a lot of different ways you can get to, you know, your target return on your idle cash, for example. So it makes sense that people are looking to sort of upgrade these cash management and data analytics skills to me as well. And then, you you know, you sort of coupled the fact that everybody has a lot of interest in bank APIs and the fact, hey, can we do things even more real time? Can we use cash even more effectively through intraday positioning and, you know, more proactively being able to project how cash is changing, how our cash outlook is changing during the course of the day. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And I don't know if the rest of the group has any other thoughts on this particular topic before. We, okay, it looks like Dan has, has one point he wants to add. I got a thought. It's on the second half of that thing, and I'll be very succinct. It's a lot easier to create a data lake now. So now you got to hire people to figure out what the heck to do with all the data in the data lake besides drink it. That's my point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, and so maybe moving to the next theme, it's, uh, you know, so we talked a little bit here about, you know, data lakes, but just in general, you know, uh, treasury digitization projects are really in full swing, right? There's a lot of treasury tech projects that are sort of in, in full swing, which we saw as a big survey results. Last year's survey, we saw nearly 75% of organizations looking to undertake some sort of project to upgrade their treasury tech stack. This year, same thing, you know, obviously companies looking to to undertake investments, but also looking to execute on the investments that they made last year. And so the areas where companies are investing most, cash management, 55%, payments, 53%, which are two themes we already touched upon, I think, during earlier, uh, earlier points during the, the conversation here. And the main objectives for these tech investments are, you know, improving the systems that are in use by the, their department to support recent growth, um, and to gain better visibility into key data to drive better insights. So a lot of the, a lot of the same themes we're seeing el elsewhere, right? Just less generating reports, more analyzing reports, gaining insights, improving the business, that sort of thing. And the other thing, which I think might be the, one of the most interesting points of the whole survey, is the most important criteria when it, it's assessing a tech investment. Uh, number one was support for modern analysis technologies like AI and machine learning, 29%. Uh, responded in that way and then the second is support for modern banking technologies which you have to think what's implied there is, is open banking api so 22 percent uh indicating that was the most important criteria and so kate maybe i'll direct this one to you so you know people are out there they're obviously undertaking treasury tech investments they're looking to improve their processes what do you think is going to drive this in 2003 do you, you think it's going to be driven by these focal areas for you know functions to be improved, cash management, fraud prevention, whatever it might be. Is it driven by you know coming market technologies, AI, uh, you know bank, open banking APIs, or is there sort of something else that's play here? It's a great question. I mean, it's uh, I, I broke it down basically in my head into to two parts. The first part is. What do you, uh, which areas in treasury do you expect to be most effective or affected by technology? And there, I think no matter how you look, you keep coming back to cash management and liquidity forecasting. So a little bit back to basics, but doing it so much better with technology. 
which brings us to what key tools, what key technology do we expect? As you mentioned, API, um, including you know, APIs as a as a transmission, as a connector, AI, including machine learning to refine. But those are really only tools. Um, every corporate I have talked to, and uh, you know working on this topic quite a bit with the the whole idea of AI and using machine learning to refine patterns and really to get more information is the human piece is absolutely key. And the moment we try to go too much into technology and say AI, oh now I have that. So I, you know, I don't need people. Big mistake, big problem. These are tools to help the treasurer actually make decisions and make better calls. Um, including uh, or in addition to that is robotics so lots of really interesting things coming down the pike just want to go back to also security and fraud detection because i think that's something that we're seeing uh, we're seeing as increasing and i think it'll increase in percentage even and surpass possibly cash management and liquidity forecasting in the future um the reason is of course all the uh, the, the whole idea of the open flank when we talk about open banking and open data or real-time payments or instant payments the more the faster the more complex of course the more protection we need and the more protection the treasurer needs so that's sort of how i would you know sort of lay it out uh, as a start yeah agreed i mean to me what these results mean are that yeah i think the markets inform that ai machine learning those technologies but, right, open banking APIs, same thing, right? But I think what people are maybe thinking, for is that, hey, if I'm going to be making an investment in 2023, I want to get on the right train. You know, I want to be with a provider who's going to, you know, fully see these technologies to help me realize all the benefits. Help me with the adoption. Help me understand the use of AI. So it's just interesting to see the message sort of put that message out there to the provider. So. Uh, any other thoughts on on this one in terms of tech investments for Treasury in, in 2023? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick with, with one thing. Great points, uh, Kate. Um, you know, one thing on the um, you know use of some of these newer technologies like AI, machine learning, and APIs. One thing we've noticed in you know everyone's plans to adopt technology or to do certain services, there's all these great plans, and the actual adoption tends to be discounted off of the plans, 20, 25, 30, 35% on a year to year, two year basis. But with these two types, with AI, you know, API and machine learning, the adoption is exceeding what the expectation is. And largely from the reasons that Kate, you and John mentioned that providers are embedding these types of services and tech into their systems and that's being used. This is really interesting because it's always been discounted. Now we're seeing them being adopted faster. Um, that was, that's just one point. Yeah. Well, what do you guys think about the whole problem you know, that I see all the time about standardization, the fact that every bank has their own API, every provider has their own APIs. There is no such thing as the API. Therefore, even though it's simpler than your old host-to-host -host connections, there's also it's also far more difficult, which of course passes the ball to players such as TIS who make connectivity easier. So, you know, what's what are your thoughts on that? That's that's a pretty good one, Kate. Um, you know, I don't think they're as panicked about it as some people would say, but it definitely plays to a TIS strength. And I think you, you know, if you look at the way cash management's done in Brazil, I mean, that's basically migrating around the globe, which is almost think of TIS as kind of like a van. I don't mean to disrespect you, York, but think about it that way. Keep in mind, though, that one of the real sort of articles of faith for a global company is they like everything the same. So if you can't do it, you know, so they sit there and go, if you can cover 78% of the globe one way with a particular process, they're going, that means I have to have multiple processes and that bugs them. So that would be more the issue I see with respect to, to some of this. Um, uh, my two cents on that one. Thanks. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Actually, within the survey, the, the largest group that planned to not adopt APIs in 2023 was that enterprise level group. And I'm thinking it's for the exact reason that, that you're saying, Dan, is that that group is favoring standardization, you know, processes globally much more for adopting modern technologies that might not fully support the use cases. But I also agree with what Craig is saying around, you know, 
the, the adoption is a lot faster than I think a lot of people assumed it was going to be, and the market's definitely pushing it. Had a lot of great conversations at AFP about companies who are pursuing API strategies. EIS has been helping our customers sort of explore API strategies, learn about APIs, figure out how the use cases that fit their business and things like that. So I think that's the role of the provider to answer that question. And you know, TIS's role as well is to sort of help our customers, help the market pursue these strategies, pursue these technologies, find the value in them, you know, within their business and ultimately enable them to do that in a way that it would be a lot simpler than trying to implement a strategy, you know, sort of independently with on a provider. Um, but yeah, maybe moving on to theme five here, um, you know, that we're seeing is, you know, throughout the survey, big theme in terms of cash forecasting really being focused for businesses, right? Not a theme that's new in 2023. I think this theme's been around for, you know, three to five years at this point with companies having a really, really strong focus on cash forecasting and improving these processes. So that's what we're going to say. 55%. Planning to invest in their cash management and forecasting solutions. I think we quoted that stat a little bit earlier. Um, in terms of the breakdown for how uh, organizations are doing forecasting today, we had about 45% doing that through a TMS and 30% doing that with on Excel. So about 75% made up of those two you know, software solutions, call them, for forecasting. The rest of the between specialized solutions, you know, ERP ingrained cash forecasting solutions and some companies that just aren't forecasting at all. Um, you know, in terms of frequency for forecasting, still the most common um, sort of time frame for the forecast is to create a forecast weekly. But on either side of that, you have almost an equal split of companies that are forecasting monthly or forecasting daily. Uh, and so you're starting to see a lot of that transition toward real-time cash management, real-time updates of the forecast getting that sort of, you know, that, that latest picture by incorporating data in real time. And in terms of accuracy for, I mean, in terms of objectives for uh, for improving the forecasting process in 2023, increasing the accuracy was number one. And close behind that was extending the forecast timeline. So maybe you're forecasting 12 weeks, you want to get out to 26 or 52 weeks. Or for those that are still on the Excel, that 30% moving to some sort of a software uh, solution, right? So. And generally, I'll point out to Craig, I think, first here, in terms of you know, forecasting being a major topic, having been a major topic for a couple of different years now, you know, what do you think is driving this? And, and generally, are the requirements and the equity starting to change a little bit? Yeah, I think I, I think I heard most of your question. What's what's driving the, the change? What's the expectation? Yeah, since it's the a perennial top one, two, or three item, uh, why isn't that solved? Why is it taking so long? There's a number of factors that, that go into that. One is um, an increased view of the importance. Every time there's a crisis, uh, there's more attention paid to it. And in the past, if you look back several decades, people, um, you know, senior management, executive management gets excited about, you know, the forecast and the tools to manage through it, but then they forget it after the crisis ends. Now, since 2008, 2009, I don't think that's the case. There's been this perennial focus um, on it or a continual focus without much diminishment. And we've had enough exciting time. So um, I guess we see this as um, companies uh, will spend more on it. They would spend more time on it. They will use technology to do it. Um, when we entered the COVID era, um, all of a sudden people had to do one, two, three or four models on a regular basis, every week, every short period of time. We were tracking that through the um, the Treasury Coalition, which TIS and Treasury webinars, et cetera, were part of. Um, and so you, we saw this, uh, this increased expectation. That is really hard and terrible to do that on a manual basis. And uh, so this idea of can we run and support more models, put in different scenarios becomes you know, vital for managing the the storms that are going on. Um, I can't remember all the rest of the, the items of the question that you said because it, it got a little distorted there. But there's more of a commitment to doing that, and people are putting in the tech to focus on their zero-day forecast, look out longer. Um, they've long been focused on you know what's running through your bank accounts, create and extend that in the future, use other models. Um, you know, and and then what was more sophisticated in the past was using you know, regression against you know, large sets of numbers, but even the use of AI and machine learning for 
uh, for helping that out. You know, system enabled forecasting is continuing to grow in different areas, different sectors supported by the technology providers. So I think I answered most of what you asked there, John, maybe a little, a little too much. Yeah, I think you covered, you covered most of it. It was a, it was a lengthy question, but yeah, in general, I mean, I'd agree. It's, 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 you know, more so this this continuing trend of not just creating the report, but deriving insights from what you're preparing there, right? Is it really what, how the, uh, how I think the expectations change around forecasting. So we're definitely seeing a lot of that in the market. And, you know, from that standpoint, People need to be able to create forecasts faster, more on demand, because if you're spending a week creating the forecast, the data is stale by the time you go to analyze it, right? So I think that's a, probably a key point um, that I'm seeing in the market as well. Thoughts from you on this one. I know you're a former treasurer, you know, doing cash forecasting, now offering a forecasting solution out to the market just to kind of get your, your viewpoints on how this process is changing. Yeah, there is no doubt a pillar of effective cash management is cash forecasting done right. And uh, our survey respondents uh, were asked several questions so we could assess the lay of the land relative to cash forecasting. And there was one surprise, at least for me, in the data while flipping through it. Uh, over 60% of survey respondents find it very easy or easy to generate a cash forecast. That's a surprise, right? But <laughs> this is the standard short-term cash forecast. Only. And two things are difficult, are really difficult based on my experience without adequate uh, technology support. First, uh, yeah, there needs to be a mid and long-term cash forecast and because this is strategic and this is what the CFO expects and this medium to long term a cash forecast is really a challenge why because first you need to collaborate with your colleagues there's a lot of knowledge in your subsidiaries they are close to the market and you need to collaborate through workflows collecting data from all the different sources and data feed is a challenge different systems need to be attached to the cash forecast <clears throat> different ERP systems maybe uh, CRM systems with regards to top line. This is one thing, and the, the the holy grail of cash forecasting. At the end, you need to be able to explain the gap between forecast and actuals, and this uh, requires a deep dive into the data. This uh, requires that you earmark your cash flows, um, and this is not easy at all. And this is where we can help. Oh, really good point. Yeah, me, you know, you have. Yeah, one me, of, oh, go ahead, Ernie. You have something? Let me, yeah, let me kind of jump in here because this was surprising to me too, Jurgen. John and I talked about this yesterday. Um, if you look at the use of the cash forecast, it's not quite as surprising because a lot of these folks were using it for balance sheet, right, or something. So for them, it might be easy, right, because they're looking at a very high level and the accuracy is not quite, you know, as hard. So it's easy right? Is it accurate? Those are two different questions. So I completely agree. Because when I've done other surveys, um, even on FDNA side, is it easy to, you know, do any kind of robust planning, you know, um, scenario analysis? The answer is no. So sometimes it's kind of hard to reconcile, but I always get back to this is only our pool of, you know, of survey respondents. So obviously, I think those are two things. You look at the frequency, and you look at the uses for the forecast and it's not quite as surprising. I wish it was 60%. I would say looking at people that do it daily, I would say that number is probably 25% if that, that would just be in my opinion of the actual landscape. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, I think a lot of the findings here tie nicely into the other finding as well. So, you know, people are looking to mainly increase the accuracy of their cash forecast in 2023. Why is that? Because cash management is becoming more important and you can't manage cash with an inaccurate forecast, right? It's if you're kind of using that as your blueprint to manage the business. And, you know, people looking to extend out the timeline for their forecast as well. Why is that? Well, Treasury wants to be more strategic. And if you're helping the organization plan strategic activities, you got to be projecting out, you know, 52 weeks or whatever it might be to plan cash liquidity requirements far out, far out in the future, right? So I think a lot of these results really tie in nicely to each other. Um, and um, what, oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, no, I just wanted to add, I mean, it, it's maybe the, the you know, the, 
short and sweet view, but for me, there's three elements. Um, you know, why is all this changing? First of all, we have far better connectivity. You could include so many more sources and pieces of the organization, you know, break down those silos. Secondly, data, um, that you're really getting the data. And then uh, thirdly, using the technology, everything we just talked about for analyzing and really getting, you know, doing the drill down and having different layers or using different techniques and technology to actually get the answers. So for me, that's, that's a major change over time. Yeah, no, I agree completely. You know, I'll, I'll toss in one since Craig decided to introduce regression analysis. Um, you know, one thought as you go forward and you start to look at solutions, you've got to understand the difference between AI and regression analysis. Uh, you know, what are you really getting with one approach versus another? And if you don't understand that difference, it's probably a good idea to sort of go slow on changing your solutions. There's certainly an awful lot, um, you know, the old gag about the difference between um, the, you know, uh, something hypothetical in the Loch Ness Monster, as some people claim to have seen the Loch Ness Monster. Some of the AI solutions are perhaps leading um, their capabilities uh, a little bit more anticipatory about their functionality than the reality. So my two cents on that one as well, thanks. Yeah, I was actually gonna bring up that point. So it was interesting to see there was a really strong interest in AI and machine learning throughout the, the entire survey, people looking to adopt those technologies, but those looking to ingrain it into their cash forecasting process in 2023 was only 15%. So it wasn't like really a main driver of the forecasting results yeah. that we saw there too, which sort of leaves the question, who do they want to bring it into, you know, if, if not in the forecasting process, which seems like one of the key use cases. Maybe it's here, you know, in theme six, which was payment security and fraud, fraud risk becoming a top concern in 2023. That's where it is. So, yeah, so it could be this is where it's where it's starting to come in here. Um, you had we had asked a question about what organization's primary risk mitigation focus was, and that 31% of eliminating manual payments, which has sort of been one of those treasury objectives forever. We just want to you know get rid of the manual payments. Everybody recognizes the risk that's there, that that's the riskiest activity for treasury. There was another 21% that said they wanted to outsource the maintenance of vendor payment instructions, which makes sense too, right? A lot of the fraud threats coming in these days are, you know, attackers looking to attack the vendor master through AP, get a fraudulent account into that vendor master so that next AP batch run that goes, you know, that the company's making fraudulent payments and they want to make the risk by outsourcing the, the maintenance of those instructions. And then we had 55% say they plan to implement some sort of account validation <laughs> or fraud detection tool by the end of 2023. And maybe this is where a lot of API, uh, AI, machine learning type functionality is gonna work itself into you know, a company's sort of tech stack over the course of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the next year or so. And then, so question about this, I think, you know, Craig, maybe I'll, I'll pose this one to you here. You know, it seems like, so I would have thought that fraud was gonna be a really big trend last year. That was kind of one of my predictions, but it seems like fraud didn't get as much Tension in the industry is, as a lot of people were really thinking it was going to be. And, it, and if you look at the survey result, it's not because the threats aren't there. The threats are increasing year over year exponentially. The losses are increasing, right? So, but the attention to it doesn't seem to be keeping pace with that, right? And I guess, do you think that's going to change at all in 2023? Or, you know, do you even agree with that at all, first of all, I guess? And, you know, are there any factors that they might bring more attention to the fraud topic during 2023? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the idea that um, fraud continues to increase, the losses are there, though we've been paying attention to it and taking steps to mitigate it for well over five years, close to 10 years, um, means that uh, perhaps we're not taking it seriously. Um, you know, it's uh, in terms of losses, it's not like it's abated like uh, the, COVID, uh, the COVID impact. Uh, it's still there, it's still, um, it's still growing the sophistication increases. So I think this is um, this is an area that um, we can keep saying, we wish more people paid attention to it. People get the religion when they're hit with the fraud more so. If you talk to bankers who deal with far more companies, and if you look at the research, you see that they're, the more you know about fraud, the more you're concerned um, about it and take steps to move your standards up to what's commercially reasonable. Um, you know, you mentioned a stat, I think it was 21% um, talked about outsourcing like uh, uh, payment master record information. 
And that's kind of the idea of, you know, if you talk to a surgeon, they're like, let's remove the appendix. If it's a little bit inflamed because it could get reinfected, if you don't have it, you can't get it. You can't get appendicitis. Of course, you can get other things, but uh, they're surgeons, so they want to focus on that. Now, uh, you think about that with, you know, outsourcing vendor master records or tokenizing items. Now there's a there's an area where you're not responsible for the surface area of attack, and so you've minimized. I think those are those are the, those are the few of the areas that people are concerned about. We're moving on to new payment rails. Criminals are far more sophisticated. They get so much funding from this, they can continue to attack. We are going to see over time, you know, our payment processes continue to be attacked. And there's a there's a bit of a complacency on that. If you look at the, the exposure to files in many companies, um, they're they're open um, and they will get hacked. Uh, it's it won't just be social engineering. So we have to be at least uh, moderate plus concerned about uh, about uh, payment security and security, or or we're in trouble in doing a disservice to our companies. Especially especially as we go towards instant payments, I would really underline that. You know various times yeah um, i would also i would also like to encourage folks this is a topic of incredible importance um craig the survey that you do on fraud controls is amazing so if you haven't looked at that survey for fraud and controls and payment security from both perspectives um you guys should go strategic treasure website and check out those surveys along with the other ones that's probably my favorite fraud and controls uh survey sorry afp that craig's is better now so I encourage you guys to take that on. I'll add a point, and it's 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 a it's one worth attending to because I think everybody's right exactly right on about the concerns. But sometimes there's a sense of um, complacency, which is you know we got our cyber team on the case, and you know everybody's completed the questionnaire. But many times the technologists who are responsible for this lack context. They don't understand what treasury and payments do. So the protections they build are not necessarily as appropriate as they should be to your use case. So that's just something to attend to uh, in your spare time of which most treasurers have an abundance. Yeah, that's a good point about, you know, the the uh, attention definitely comes once you have that fraud loss, right? Once there's a fraud loss, it gets the CFO's attention. That seems to spark, you know, the, the company's desire to invest in the solution. But if you're, it, it's always on the treasurer's mind, it seems like, because the treasury, the AP people see this stuff come through on a day-to-day -day basis, the business even compromise attempts, the fake wire instruction change request attempts. So one thing that we do suggest to our customers is if you're looking to sort of implement something is, is the account validation route is kind of a good route to go to because you're kind of hitting it from two different angles. You know, first of all, account validation, you're validating, you know, the the uh, the uh, beneficial owner, the beneficiary of that payment, the account standing, right? So you're doing some checks that help you a lot with fraud detection, but you're also validating the account number and routing information before that payment's made, stuff that helps with operational processes like wire returns, right? So you're kind of hitting it from two different angles, and it's a little bit easier for businesses to make the case if they're saying, hey, we're, we're solving an operational complexity, there's a cost savings here, and we're preventing, a, we're protecting ourselves on the back end for fraud as well, so. But definitely a topic I hope gets a lot more attention in 2023. It's just going to become, you know, more and more of a problem for treasury organizations. You know, John, John, just one question on that. You know, the idea that we've often at times had uh, services that are um, detective in nature. You know, it's like, hey, there's a fraud that's happened, and you respond as quickly as you can to to mitigate the risk or to to block it. And then these more preventative type uh, controls that. Uh, like you said, a community awareness or pre-filtering or sanction filtering ahead of time. There's a, a handful of those services. It, it there's no way to get around it. You need preventative and detective controls um, to to match what's what's occurring on the uh, attacker side. Yeah, I think yeah. it's an important point that, that you brought up because the response is absolutely important. It, not only payments, but security, hack, data. So I don't think that gets enough attention. The best weapon that companies should have on fraud protection is employee training. Give these people some pizza. Everyone that touches something does something. Let them know that they're watching and what you're doing about it. So from one of Craig's previous surveys, the ROI, the employee education, uh, is really off the charts. So I would encourage folks to make sure their folks really understand 
the raw, the not only the current risk but existing risk, especially as you start to go across borders and change whether you're working remotely or not.